We often visit the topic of Kempo on this channel. With its rich history and various styles, there is a lot to talk about. Today, we have a special guest with us. Many know him from the Karate Kid tournament, as well as the inventor and stunt performer of the Crane Kick. However, he is also a 10th degree grandmaster teaching Kempo and Filipino stick fighting in his Murrieta school. He was inducted into the 2019 Kempo Hall of Fame, and today, he's with us to talk about the history and evolution of the art. We offer a very warm welcome to Grandmaster Daryl Vidal. You've mentioned that in previous interviews that your brother and Bruce Lee were your inspirations to get into the martial arts. How did you start your martial arts journey? Uh, yeah, that, that is how it happened. Um, early in the, in the early 70s, my brother uh, in San Diego started taking some karate classes. Uh, and then type, I think what happens typically is the older brother does it and then brings it home and uses it on his younger brothers. So, so I'm the youngest of three. And, uh, you know, I say that jokingly, but he, he did teach us, you know, he would show this is how we learn to punch and this is how we learn to kick. And and so I was immediately, you know, following, uh, following his lead and, and learning the movements. Uh, and then we moved to, uh, to Chino, California, which is like closer to Los Angeles. And uh, one of our neighbors was a martial artist. Uh, both in Filipino stick fighting and in Kung Fu. And so he had a gym in his, his garage and we would train with him there and, uh, you know, learn to kick the bag and do some light sparring. Uh, and then my brother and I both, uh, with one of my neighbors, joined up uh, the, the community, you know, Chino Parks and Rec community uh, karate program with my instructor, Joe Rosas, who's still my sensei. And uh, started from there, and I was like uh, 13 years old, uh, and that was where I got started. What were your expectations? Like, what was in your mind, and, you, and what you expected when you walked into your first class versus your impression when you left? Oh, wow, when I left, I mean, we're talking about a span of, you know, a decade or so. Uh, but I think I think one of the the things that um, happens when you uh, go train in a a uh, parks and rec and, it, and i think it's kind of reflected in the karate kid because uh you know when uh when daniel is first talking about it with mr with his mom right after he gets into the first fight uh, she says well you took karate and he says not at the why and uh, i always kind of equate that you know taking karate at a parks and rec is kind of like taking it at the why and you know uh you know so it's it's not a, an official dojo it's a it's a community shared space uh, and, you know, you don't have, you know, all the karate trophies and memorabilia and weapons that you might see. It's, it's basically a shared space. It's only a dojo when we're there. Uh, and, and so I think that's always a little underwhelming for people that walk into a, a class and say, oh, this is the Parks and Rec karate. You know, it's, it's not like an official dojo. We don't have all the punching bags all lined up and, uh, you know, speed bow or whatever the, the implements are. Uh, you know, you're, you're walking into, you know, a shared space. And, uh, but, you know, I think, you know, this as well as anybody, Daniel, is that uh, it's really the quality of training that you get there. Uh, you know, the, the implements can help a lot, but, you know, they can also be a hindrance if not used correctly. So uh, that, that's, and that's the reason I continue to teach through my Mir my city, Murrieta Parks and Rec is because, I, I, you know, it allows me to have a regular job, uh, train, uh, you know, in, in the evenings and offer a very cost effective, uh, you know, program that I can encourage families to train together, you know, because I can discount that, uh, the rates uh, and, and uh, you know, just making it very affordable uh, to, uh, to families. And I think that's, that's how I answer it. So your question was, you know, what was my expectation going and coming when it's the same sort of thing? You know, I, I joined up and uh, here we are in a shared space. So it's like, oh, it's not a real karate dojo. But as soon as I saw them lined up and training and joined up with them, uh, I, I felt fine. You know, I, I didn't feel like this was going to be any kind of uh, second Fiddle, you know, martial arts. And then when we would go to tournaments and we would compete, you know, we were, we were competing right along with everybody else. 
by the time I finished with them, I mean, I didn't really technically finish because uh, I, I got older, got married, moved away, uh, but I would still go back and visit. So, but I, I think that the space changed significantly over the years, you know, they would, you know, now they annex as part of the room to use for daycare, or, you know, the place got smaller or they redid it. So it changed physically in a few ways, but it was still that, you know, shared community space. Uh, and it always, um, you know, had a sentimental part in my, when I go, even if I go back there now, I still feel a little bit sentimental about, you know, this is where we started training, you know, 40 plus years ago. And I also remember um, hearing you in a previous interview saying that Bruce Lee was one of your influences and got you in the cross training. Um, how did that transition you into doing different arts and what arts did you try? The first Kung Fu movies that we were exposed to, uh, even before uh, Enter the Dragon, uh, were those those funny Shaolin movies, you know, Five Fingers of Death, and uh, the guys would blow up and jump over trees and, you know, had hats that they could kill you with. So th those were the first ones. Uh, and, and they were so funny because I look back uh, and, you know, you can remember this. <laughs> Uh, sort of fighting, and my my brother and I would we would go out and in the in the yard and mimic those moves, and so it's so far from you know what really tr what training is really like, but you know it it really it really hit home with us. But then, where I think the first Bruce Lee movie that that I did see at the theaters was uh, Chinese Connection, um, <clears throat> and that's where you know I think. Bruce Lee revolutionized, you know, martial arts in the movies. And then in terms of cross training, so I talked about my neighbor. Uh, and one of the books that my neighbor had was the Tao of Jeet Kune Do, uh, Bruce Lee's book. Uh, and so, you know, it's it's interesting. It's, it's really a flip through book. You know, you can you can go through it and, and, and read up all the different stuff and the drawings that he has. But uh, he, he talks about his his Kung Fu, Chinese boxing, you know, his grappling. Uh, as I was going up the ranks, uh, I, you know, I trained with my instructor in Kempo, but then uh, in, as a freshman in, in high school, I also started wrestling, which is, I think, you know, everybody needs to have some, some grappling, some wrestling. Uh, and then uh, at, as a junior, I started boxing. I joined the local Chino boxing club and, uh, you know, started straight boxing. And that's kind of where I learned to punch, you know, because it's a different, it's a different punch, something that you follow through on and uh, really put it in. And it really affected my, my karate sparring because uh, it, 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 it caused me to, you know, hit people in the face harder. <laughs> uh, so it also affected my, my, my point sparring because I would hit people and get disqualified and stuff like that. So that was the next thing, and then as you, as you, you know, kind of follow in Bruce Lee's step, uh, you know, you have to go and explore Wing Chun. So I, you know, read all the books that were available at the time, which are very sparse. But I did have a, a friend of mine who, who went away and traveled to Seattle, I believe, and, and studied with James DeMille for a while, who was one of Bruce Lee's students. Uh, and he spent, you know, close to a year there. And then when he came back, I trained with him extensively and, and, and kind of by osmosis learned a lot of the Wing Chun that he had brought back. Um, and so I always gravitate to Wing Chun uh, because I still feel it's part of my roots, but I don't hold any kind of, you know, ranking or, or formal, uh, you know, belt or anything in Wing Chun. So I would say, you know, Kempo, wrestling, boxing, Wing Chun, and then the Screamer, you know, Filipino stick fights are really the the core of what I trained in. I'm particularly fascinated in the Kempo aspect because we both have Kempo backgrounds, although vastly different, uh, but it appears yes. like the roots of our systems do kind of cross paths at some point. What can you tell us about your instructor, uh, Joe Rosas, and the style of Kempo that he taught? Right. Uh, Joe Rosas's instructor was Danny Guzman, who worked, had a black belt both from uh, Ed Parker uh, as well as uh, Bill Rosaki. Uh, and Bill Rosaki, as you know, was a student of Ed Parker. Uh, so the system, though, that we trained in uh, was not similar to um, 
<clears throat> to Parker's uh, system. So uh, I don't know necessarily where Guzman got his other stuff. Because if you look into, if I talk to him, which, you know, we've had several different times where we, we don't talk about his, his training, you know, they always seem to talk about uh, John Leone and James Matosi. You know, these guys are, are names that you hear uh, and, and they're mostly coming out of Hawaii but they're not, uh, you know, they, they don't branch into directly into Ed Parker's, uh, you know, American Kempo. Um, and so when I look at our system, it looks a lot more like uh, a Hawaiian, Hawaiian style uh, that, uh, that I've seen out there. So I, I actually see similarities with Kaju Kempo and some of these Lima Lama systems when I look at their katas and look at their their uh, self-defense techniques, they, they, they seem to have a lot of similarities. But I, I don't think that we can draw a direct, um, a direct conclu uh, connection because, you know, we get, we have our katas, our kata one, two, three, four, five, you know, they just go by numbers. But they're fixed katas and they're shared between our school and, and all of other, uh, Dan Guzman's other students who we can name off, you know, uh, Dave Torres and, you uh, George Franco and Rudy Cordero, these were colleagues of my instructor, Joe Rosas, and we all shared the same katas. We would compete with the same katas in tournaments. So that all came from Dan Guzman. And I couldn't tell you at what point, uh, you know, how much of that was developed by him, how much he got from Musaki, uh, and how much of it, you know, was shared with, with Ed Parker's American Kempo. That's interesting. You showed me an infographic um, showing a little bit of lineage that went back to um, Adriano Imperato. Would you say that there's any similarities between um, Karaho Kempo or the Hawaiian Kempo that uh, William Chow taught? Um, I would have to say yes, but I couldn't tell you what parts of it because that lineage that I, I, I saw was given to me by, uh, by a, a person who's done a lot of publishing and history uh, and documentation of Kaju Kempo. And he trained with us for a time uh, and then went on to train under Kaju Kempo and got his higher, his higher rankings from Kaju Kempo. So at a certain point, he actually separated from our school. Uh, and then, and that's about the time he started to really do a lot of, you know, report, uh, writing articles and, and doing history and research. And I respect the work that he's done a lot. Uh, but um, I, I can't, I can't say that, um, you know, his writings and works uh, reflect directly onto what we learned uh, under Joe Rosas, because at a certain point, he actually, uh, we separated. So Karaho, Karaho is uh, a name or a, a style that I had heard being part of our lineage. Uh, if I go back and find, you know, some, I think I can go back and find some certificates at the wall that say like Karaho Kempo Karate. Uh, and I don't really know, you know, the, the whole uh, history of, of that, that, uh, that lineage. The Kempo that you're teaching now, is that the same curriculum that you learned with Mr. Rosas or have you made any modifications? Um, I've, I've made additions. So, you know, I, I took our original uh, curriculum, which was, you know, and it's kind of a standard curriculum. It's, you know, four corner covers, uh, katas, uh, and then uh, self-defense techniques. And I haven't really changed the kata as much. I'm pretty much teaching them all the way through kata eight. Uh, kata five is kind of your own kata, but all the way to kata eight, pretty much the same way that he's still teaching them in his his school, and we teach it at our school. Uh, the self defense techniques um, I I added on to them based on uh, you know my additional training with both you know, Eskrima or, or Filipino stick fighting and uh, some jujitsu that I had trained in and, and other, uh, you know, the grappling arts wrestling. So uh, I would take the, the initial, you know, two or three move technique and then add a follow through a takedown or a, or a arm lock or something to it. And that's what, what we continue to, to train in. But I've established that, you know, it's on 30 years now. So I've been teaching those systems for, for 30 years. Yeah, I want to ask you about the kata, too. I watched an interview with you and uh, William Christopher Ford, and you guys were walking through some of the kata steps, and you made the comment that 
The first four kata resembled more of the old traditional Okinawan karate, whereas the later kata was more flowy, like the Japanese or the Chinese martial arts. Was that initially like intended by design, or were they just adapted from different source material? Uh, yeah, you know, um, I th I think I think it's the way it evolved because it, again, I'm teaching them the way that I learned them, but I was always told that. Uh, at a certain point, uh, the founders, uh, you know, started to inc incorporate more Chinese style into into the system. So you saw these softer moves, uh, you know, the more oblique angles, uh, and uh, you know, it's even some jumping, jump kicking moves that you know weren't in the traditional karate. So that's how how I think they came about. But um, it, it, it's interesting because. Um, you know, through the years and going to, uh, you know, a lot of the events I go to, I've met some very well studied, uh, you know, older gentlemen who trained way back in the old days with Parker, you know, uh, with, you know, Douglas Wong and, and, and some of the stories that they'll tell you are about, you know, Ed Parker coming uh, and then training with these Kung Fu guys and adding some of that Kung Fu into his curriculum. Now, I don't want to start any fights or anything, but, you know, uh, I think you can see it. You can see it when, uh, uh, and, you, and you can you can read about it, uh, but I couldn't I couldn't dissect it for you. Yeah, no, Ed Parker Campbell, it's, it's definitely a melting pot. And, you know, I thought it was just a couple of arts when I first started training, but as I expanded out and explored other arts, like I started taking judo, jiu-jitsu a couple years ago, and I started to see just how much of how much judo was already infused in the art that I didn't know was there. And I know there's some sansu in there. There's, it's quite a mixture. So it's, it's interesting to see where those influences come from. And um, do your techniques kind of show the same mirror thing where, where the earlier techniques are more linear and Japanese resembling and then the later techniques, the self-defense techniques are more uh, Chinese martial arts? Well, I wouldn't equate it as Chinese, but I would definitely uh, equate it as more complex, you know, uh, it, as opposed to block, punch, punch, kick, you know, type of technique where, you know, they're incorporating more stylized movements, you know, multiple strike hits you know, a takedown, an arm lock, uh, you know, some things that you, that you don't see in, you know, like traditional karate. And that fifth kata you mentioned where it's kind of up to the student to create their own, um, is there a specific mindset that you guide them on or that you're looking for, or is it just to let them do a free exploration? What is, what is the goal that you're looking for for a student generating their own kata? Th that's a good question, and I'm glad you asked it. It, it happens for our our green belt, right? You learn kata one through four up through blue belt. And then for, for your green belt, your, your first requirement for green belt is kata five. And you have to develop your own kata. Uh, and the requirements that we lay out to them are, you know, it has to have 30 moves. You have to know how many, uh, you know, striker, how many opponents you have. You have to be able to explain what you're doing as it, at each move. Uh, and you have to know where you start and where you end. But we don't have a specific, you know, you can, you know, do this or do that. Uh, and, but we do kind of say use moves from the katas that you know. Uh, use moves from the self-defense techniques that we teach, you know, the, 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 the techniques. And, and, and use moves that you use sparring. Uh, and, and so um, you usually come up with pretty, pretty um, consistent types of karate, although every now and then you'll see somebody doing you know, something that came out of a movie that, you know, we never taught or something like that. But yeah, it, it, that's kind of how we set it up. Not just stringing along a sequence together for the sake of it. Yeah, no. Punch, punch, punch. Kick, kick, yeah. kick, you know. <laughs> And I, I like that you actually have it in, in the middle range of the curriculum because, like, with American Kempo, we have a thesis kata for when we're going for our black belt. That's where we have to construct ours and kind of with the same idea. But I like that you put it earlier in the system to kind of see and give that challenge early on because it can be overwhelming for a lot of students. I mean, I've got, I know a lot of people, myself included, that was overwhelmed, you know, with the expectations for developing the kata, especially for black belt. But to introduce it that early, I like that. And I think that's, I think that's a great way to acclimate the student into – understanding the art at deeper levels earlier. Yeah, I agree. I, I think, uh, one, it shows, uh, it, it puts a little initiative back onto them to say, okay, now you're getting, we consider green belt like a senior belt. So you're going to be getting ready to get to this level where you're going to be considered a senior belt. You know, you're going to need to do this. Uh, and then for our black belt, we, you have to have a weapons kata, which you have to 
that you've developed on your own. So that's kind of like step two. Uh, and then you have to have your theme and you have to have your own self-defense techniques. So uh, it's the same sort of thing of developing other uh, stuff on your own uh, in addition to, you know, that kind of five. At Parker Campo, sometimes people look at it like, wow, there's like 154 self-defense techniques. It looks ridiculous. Uh, but as I start doing my deeper dives, start to realize that it's not so much 154 individual techniques, but they're all really just variations of a handful of them. And it's interesting to kind of see how one technique takes an idea and it breaks it apart and it reverses it from another technique. So in your system, uh, your self-defense techniques, do you encourage a lot of mixing and matching or alteration on the student's part? To, or do you prefer that they learn like the absolute basics the way they are versus trying to graft techniques together? Yeah, the latter. We basically, you know, especially at the early stages, the first uh, three sets, uh, you, you learn them as, you know, learn them as they're taught. Uh, the, the only adjustments that we would expect you to make are, you know, you know, your size, your weight, your leverage points, you know, your disabilities. Uh, you, you, you know, obviously we expect you to learn how to work through those and, 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 and how to, and be able to apply them to your opponent. But, uh, uh, we, we don't have them, uh, you know, do anything outside uh, of their own development uh, that, that isn't part of the, the structured, uh, you know, technique by itself. So it's not until, like you said, the, the black belt level where they're going to come up with their own, you know, ideas for self-defense and, and then they, get, they have full control of everything. And I also want to ask about your your logo. I love your logo with the eagle and the dragon because we have the the dragon and the tiger. What's the significance of the animals in your system? Yeah, shall I bring it up? Uh, I think I have one handy right here. So uh, this was the the logo that my instructor uh, Joe Rosas had, and it's the American eagle and the Chinese dragon. So it was the you know the unification of the United States and, and China in the systems, uh, and then there you know there. The coloration is something that that I changed because his coloration is slightly different. But yeah, that's that's the basic premise: is the Chinese eagle, the American uh, the Chinese dragon, the American eagle. So it has nothing to do with eagle fang. <laughs> Eagles don't have fangs. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, speaking about logos, I do kind of. I've always had a curiosity about the one that you had on uh, behind you, the Locust Valley logo. Um, that mm -hmm. was the, the what you wore in the Karate Kid. Is that a real school, a real affiliation, or was that completely fictionalized? Uh, yeah, completely fictionalized. I, you know, I didn't see it until I showed up there on set, and they gave me a key and had that in the back of it. Uh, and then, you know, it wasn't it wasn't until very recently uh, rewatching the Karate Kid or some clips from it that I realized there's at least one other guy that has has it on. So he would have been my, uh, you know, my dojo classmate, but I don't. I don't know. I don't remember the guy, and we didn't train together. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was so disappointed in season four when I saw the Locust Valley logos, and, and you weren't there. I was like, ah, where are you? <laughs> yeah, you weren't the only one. <laughs> but I, I do, I, I do have a side story. Is is that uh, one of the one of the guys? Okay, there were at least five of them, right? That had the logo. Uh, one of them contacted me. He's the guy that was actually in in the season four sequence where. He fought and you know did some uh, was in the tournament wearing that gi, and he actually contacted me and said, "Hey, you know um, the guys that are wearing our the, the the Locust Valley logo are all real karate guys. They all really train, uh, just like I was brought in, you know, as kind of a you know fill in the blanks, if you will, uh, to have some." And and he said that they were they actually had a this, this really you know honored me, but they they had some discussion about trying to do things that get picked up in the show that reflect, you know, what I had done in the movie. So he had told me that he did some Wing Chun moves and another guy did one of the flying kicks that I did. But when it came out uh, in the cut, you know, you really can, can see it in those moves. So <laughs> good story. Oh, I stand by I stand my previous statement that I think Locust Valley and that you guys should have completely swept the tournaments because there's, there's just no question. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Sensei. <laughs> <laughs> but it's um there's a curiosity because i mean besides all the aerial moves that you did in the movie um you did a lot of evasion and spinning back kick moves is that reflective of how you fought tournaments at the time or was that also just choreography for the film um some of it is um i i think uh just just as a little backstory um when i used to compete a lot um 
I started to learn these jumping kicks, which I would see either in a karate movie or from Bruce Lee or, um, you know, in another tournament, somebody else did it. And as, as, as I became proficient at those moves, I would create a kata that had, that used them. So by the time I was a brown belt, um, I was actually, I had a kata that had pretty much every move I, I do in the karate kid was in this kata, you know, from drop back spin to jump back spin to the, you know, the circle kicks, all those things I was doing. And so when the director was scouting, um, and he went to an actual tournament that I was competing in, he saw me do that kata. And so he, he allowed me to highlight every one of those moves, you know, basically and use them in, in, in the, in the film. Uh, and uh, so when I kind of, I didn't really have an audition because they just invited me to, to join them uh, at the, at the rehearsals. But, but when uh, they introduced me to, to Ralph, you know, I did that kata and, you know, kind of as, Hey, Hey, Daryl, show them the kata that you do, you know, and I did the kata and they were like, wow. Okay. So then they knew what, what they kind of wanted to work with, but in terms of, of sparring, you know, the jump, the, the backspin uh, and the drop backspin, I actually have used, you know, in sparring, uh, you know, obviously back hooks or, you know, round kicks, all those things. But in terms of like doing jumping, uh, you know, the, the circle kicks or, you know, high jumping back flying kicks. I, I definitely would not be doing those uh, in, in straight sparring or tournament fighting. <laughs> my, my tournament fighting was more uh, as close as I could get to cheating because I would, I would definitely use the groin shot when it's legal, right? If, if they were going to allow it, I was using it. I was going to kick you in the groin and then hit you in the face. And, and if I had scored, I'd do it three more times. <laughs> I have a you didn't learn how to protect your groin. If you didn't learn how to protect your groin, I was going to kick you there. <laughs> hey, the way I look at it, if you get hit there, it's your own fault for not blocking it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I have a I have a colleague that I spar with on, on a regular basis, and you know it's friendly sparring, but he goes for that groin shot, and it's just so many times I'll go and throw a kick or I'll throw a move, and I, I'll, I'll hit him or he'll duck, and next thing I know, I feel this uppercut right to my cup. I'm like, <laughs> how did you even get down there? How did you do that so quickly? <laughs> No, I, I don't. I don't attack with the hand uh, to the groin, but uh, you know the little quick kick is something that we would use. Since you've had a lot of tournament experience, one of my favorite things about the first film is just as far as techniques go, it, the the first tournament feels a little bit more realistic in terms of what they do. Versus like in Cobra Kai, there's a lot of flashy jump spinning stuff, but in the in the first movie, it's, it's basically round kicks, front kicks, side kicks for the most part. And um, no. how reflective were, was that film compared to the tournaments at that time? Uh, I mean, it's all choreographed, but, uh, I think, I think Pat Johnson's, uh, application or, or, uh, training, it was really reflective of what Pat Johnson was doing with the Cobra Kai guys in training, which was, you know, kind of mostly times you know, uh, and they didn't, they didn't spar, obviously, you know, you can't let actors spar with each other because they might get hurt and, you know, so, um, so, and, you know, people who spar can kind of look and say, oh, yeah, they really don't know. But then you would see somebody else, and they would have been a real karate guy, and you could see kind of how they move. Uh, so I would say that, uh, and, and there's also another fact that when they did uh, the first Karate Kid, they also threw some tournaments in L.A. called the Karate Kid Tournaments. And and they had, they there were actual tournament, they had a lot of the same people could show up and they would run the tournament just to introduce and promote the fact that this movie was being made, but also to expose a lot of the, the cast members to what a real karate tournament looks like. But when we did get around to choreographing the fights, um, a lot of, I, I mean, I didn't choreograph them. I, I was there and I, so I would be giving tips and helping out, uh, helping Pat out. And, and we were trying to make them, you know, look like a, you know, attack response, you know, scenario that you might see in point system, as opposed to, you know, doing just pure flash type of moves. So one criticism I hear a lot, and I hear this for a bunch of different arts, people who are not necessarily experienced in Kempo or, or certain styles of karate, they often say, well, if Kempo is so good, how can we never see it in sparring? Or how can we never see it in, in, in competition? Are there any signs that you you could advise people to look for? What kind of telltale signs watching a person fight that might indicate they are a Kempo practitioner? 
Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if there's there's techniques that you could that would pinpoint it, you know. But but I I, I will think I would think that you know the, the the lead back knuckle punch combination is is pretty much a straightforward com combination that we all use, you know. And uh, a lot of um, a lot of people when they start sparring will start with the you know the lead round kick or the step up round kick, you know, because you know you're at distance. Uh, and so they don't know how to close except for throwing a kick and, and that's fine. But, you know, you, you're still coming in with that kick. And if I see it, I'm going to block it and counter it. So one of, to me, one of the first, you know, level jumps that you can do is when you can learn to close using your hands only, you know, so you're, you know, you're doing this measured distance thing, ranging in, ranging out. And then you take the opportunity when you're ranged in and then, and then closing with your hands uh, by that time, you know, the kicks are out of, out of rain or, you know, too close. Uh, and then you're, you're coming in with a fusillade of strikes. So uh, that's, that's kind of the telltale that I'm looking at is saying, okay, look that, you know, it, so much of it to me is rain is the distancing and the range. Uh, and, and so I'm watching how close they're fighting. Uh, you know, if it's all far apart, you can tell they're just, you know, playing with each other and doing fake moves. Uh, and then uh, when, but when it comes right down to it, how did they close? You know, what were te what techniques did they use to close and, and get the distance? You know, were they using a feint? Uh, you know, how did they bridge the gap? You know, what did they follow through with? How did they anticipate the counter? All those type of things is kind of what I what I'm watching when I'm when I'm watching fighting. So less things that a layman would pick out versus someone who's actually training the art. They they know what to look for. Yeah, yeah, I, I would say the layman doesn't doesn't know. You know, you could kind of pretty much do anything, and they would say, "Oh, wow, that's karate." You know, but uh, you know, someone who's watching is saying, "Oh, I would have seen that." You know, or I, I, if he'd have done that, I would have done this. You know, if he'd have, if he'd have stood on one leg and did this, <laughs> I would have just stepped back and say, "Okay, wait till he puts his leg down, and then I'm going to smash him." <laughs> if only Johnny knew that one. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. So what are you hoping for the future of your students and where do you hope that they'll take Kempo in the future? Yeah, I, I like that question, um, you know, because uh, I, uh, I, I, I kind of looking for, you know, how, how it continues. You know, I have two sons, they both got their black belt, but they, uh, you know, they're having their families and their careers. And so they're not, they're not continuing their training with me right now. Uh, and then I do have my key students who still help teach and train and, and carry on the system. So um, I, I am wondering who who takes over Vidal Kempo Karate, you know, when I fall over or decide to, to retire and quit. Uh, and it's not a matter of it still Vidal Kempo Karate, you know, it would be, you know, uh, Joe Blow's Kempo Karate after that. But um, it would still be part, hopefully, that they would see that of my instructors, but, the karate, which is we, we call uh, Rosas Kempo Karate Association. So we have our association that has all our, our black belts cumulatively of all the schools that have, have come from him. And, and so, you know, for the future, you know, I, I would want one of my students or maybe a, a few of them to, to carry on training here uh, and, and branch out. I mean, it's already happened a little bit, uh, but, you know, over the years, I, I hope it continues. And um, if somebody wanted to learn more about your program in school, where could they go? Is there any uh, any good resource for them to follow up on? Yeah, uh, they could if they want to sign up and they're local to Murrieta, they could go to the Murrieta Parks and Rec, uh, you know, Murrieta, the City of Murrieta website. Go to our recreation; they could sign up there. Uh, but I also do uh, because of the pandemic, have started doing online uh, private lessons. So if they wanted to reach me. Uh, on my Facebook, my, my Facebook is Vidal Kempo, uh, and they can message me there. I'm pretty pretty accessible on social media. Uh, and then on Instagram also, they can find me at, uh, at the stupid name, which is called at Rock Breaker Boy. <laughs> Before I understood Instagram, I just kind of, okay, this is my handle, Rock Breaker. And now it's stu I'm stuck with it now. So, <laughs> But to be fair, though, there are pictures of you breaking rock rocks on there. Oh yeah, I can break rocks. <laughs> um, yep. Just to kind of wrap this one up, which is some, uh, I have a couple of fun questions for you, just kind of off the cuff, if sure. you're cool with. Um, Absolutely. All, what are your two favorite martial arts movies? The first one based on story, and the second one based on just a guilty pleasure. Mm. 
Well, guilty pleasure definitely uh, Enter the Dragon. I mean, I can pick up and watch that anytime. The problem is, is anybody who watches it with me, and this is states, this is true for Seinfeld in the office, is they're going to get mad because I'm going to say all the lines before. Uh, <laughs> and with Enter the Dragon, it's even worse because I'll I'll do it in you know in dub Chinese. You know. <laughs> Why don't you just take a uh, 45 and settle it? <laughs> so, uh, but I, I do like the discussion about different movies. And, and, and so uh, I think there were several uh, generations of, of revolution in, in martial arts movies. So, you know, I think, I think Above the Law with Steven Seagal's first, first movie uh, is, is great. Um, even though he, his movies became different and, his martial arts and whatever. <clears throat> I think the way that they highlighted Aikido in, in Above the Law is a lot of, it's very enjoyable to watch. Uh, and then um, Ong Bak, you know, was really the first time they brought, you know, uh, Muay Thai to the forefront. And I love the way Tony Ja, uh, you know, uh, beats the crap out of people using <laughs> uh, the Muay Thai. Uh, and, and, and Donnie Yen in, in the Man series, you know, and my love for Wing Chun. Man. Those are the things that that I, I really enjoy in martial arts movies. I like that you mentioned about the evolution of martial arts movies and how they've gone over time. Because uh, I've been drawn to um, uh, The Perfect Weapon. Because at that point, before that movie came out, I'd never seen Kempo in a film. I didn't even know that was Kempo when I right. first saw it. And right. that was kind of revolutionary. But I like looking at the 70s, 80s, 90s, and where they are now, and just seeing the evolution of how the martial arts are portrayed on screen. And like even now with John Wick, I mean, it's really fancy and crazy, but there's still a lot of grit and realism in there. It's a fascinating study just to see from point A to point Absolutely. B where, where American cinema has gone with it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to bring up John Wick, I, I think, you know, Keanu Reeves uh, has done a lot for, you know, uh, just, uh, just, per, just martial arts mayhem, if you will, uh, because he brings a lot to it, you know, with, you know, his judo and... Uh, his jujitsu type moves, uh, and and just uh, the straight up, uh, you know, practicality of what he does, uh, mixed with the shooting uh, skills. You know, I'm also uh, a weapons, a shooting, a shooter. So, and, and and people ask me, you know, and I'm sure they ask you, is why do you need guns if you're a martial artist? You know, it's like, well, because <laughs> other people have guns, so you need to be. You need to be adept at all weaponry, right? So that's why, you know, I think a lot of us gravitate toward that naturally. But, uh, you know, it, it, we talked about the movies and, and I always, you know, you, you asked about storyline in movies and I, I was hard pressed to find a martial arts movie with a good storyline. Uh, you know, I, but I think John Wick does accomplish that because um, to me, one of the big weaknesses of, of martial arts movies was how do they deal with guns? Uh, you know, uh, does the does the guy, you know, why are there no guns? I mean, in the dragon, there's no guns. Uh, and so you have these, you know, these massive fight scenes with armies of people, but there's no guns. Well, Steven Seagal was kind of one of the first people that dealt with, you know, guys with guns. And you could see how Aikido, you know, uh, deals with that application. John Wick, obviously, he melds the two together uh, and, and, you know, his his experience with his training in shooting and his three gun competition and his jujitsu and all that stuff. I think, I think he's done, you know, great things in, in bringing all those arts together. Yeah. John Wick is kind of in the sweet spot of, of blending. I mean, some parts where are just pure fantasy. I mean, it's, it's, let's not lie. It's a popcorn film, but right. there's exactly. just little details in there. It's like the moves he does, like you're saying, he doesn't just disarm the weapon. He actually will disarm, he'll, he'll, he'll divert, see his control, and use it while he's doing practical grappling moves. And it, like little details, like um, when they were they were shooting at him underwater, actually, the detail of the bullet's actually spinning, like, you know, absolutely the travel. I mean, just a little, I love it when they pepper in little flavors of realism in there like that, because now you've got this fantasy film that's believable. And it just wraps up. I don't know. Like the John, the John Wick movies are kind of in a little special place for me in that aspect. Well, I mean, along with that, uh, and it goes. It's a you know, it goes to his his weapons uh, skills is the the number of times he reloads uh, because I actually have gone through and counted, you know, based on the gun that he's using if he's reloading at the right time, and you know, it's usually you know six, seven, eight, uh, maybe it's fifteen depending on the gun he's using but 
you know, he loads, reloads and he does it well, you know, he's very adept at it. Uh, and, and that's what you want to see. You know, you don't want to, you know, watch Tombstone, which is one of my, my favorite movies and then have, you know, Doc Holliday shooting off 15 rounds, you know, off of two six guns. Uh, what makes you laugh? Well, I don't know. We've had some good laughs here. Uh, but I, I like good comedy. You know, I've, I've mentioned uh, both Seinfeld and The Office. Uh, my wife and I are, are still going back and watching reruns of those those uh, uh, series. And, uh, you know, we, can, we may watch a serious movie and then switch over to finish the evening with a Seinfeld episode. And it's sickening for them because I know, you know, I'm rattling off the lines and uh, it, it, you know, it's tedious for them, I'm sure, but we get a laugh out of it. So those are the one things that make me laugh. Now in karate, uh, you know, it's kind of a joke for me because I will tell, I will actually, you know, tease my younger students if I see them laughing. I'll, I'll say, there's no laughing at karate. Uh, and then, of course, that that makes them laugh more. And, you know, I'm trying to get them to, to stifle the laugh, but being kind of silly at the same time. So, uh, yeah, I, I think... I'm a fun loving person. So ultimately uh, I don't take myself. One thing is I just don't take myself too seriously. So what turns you off? Uh, well, martial arts that take themselves too seriously. Yeah. I mean, um, <clears throat> and I don't want to disparage anybody, but you know, you'll see people who have a new style named after themselves or, you know, they hold 10th degree black belts in, in three different styles. I mean, I'm not saying that's not, can't be done, you know, but, you know, I think it, it, it starts to instill a little bit of skepticism. Um, so, you know, that's why I don't have a lot of, of videos because I don't, I don't, I, I mean, but me doing martial arts because I, I don't see myself as, you know, a, a, a centralized source for you know either my system or another system or or so I, I i like to you know just say my karate kind of speaks for itself come to class train with us i think you'll you'll find a nice uh mixture of of um of traditional karate along with some pressure testing you know some life sparring and, and just an even mix of that uh you know i, I don't want to hear somebody uh you know just uh prophesizing about you know all the greatness of this history or this lineage and you know ultimately it's it's really what you teach me uh, and what what i teach you or how we work together and, and, and benefit from it you know past or present fictional or real who is your dream sparring match uh you know and i know people take hits for saying stuff like this but i'd love to spar with bruce lee because uh, a lot of people actually go back and say you know bruce lee didn't spar a lot uh, maybe he did, maybe he got a lot of street fights, but it's not, you know, widely filmed. There's like what, two or three videos from 1968 where he did some sparring, but it's still in a very controlled situation. Uh, it wasn't in a ring. It wasn't with judges for points. Uh, so I would like to go with it at, go at it with him. And, and people would say, Oh, you couldn't take Bruce Lee. Bruce, you know, Bruce Lee is the greatest of all time. And you hear that discussion with different people. Uh, but, you know, I, it wouldn't be vindictive or for malicious. We would go and, you know, if he's that much faster and got better technique, then, you know, make, he'll wait the floor with me or what. But, you know. I can understand that because also part of it, too, seems like you just almost want to feel what it's like to experience that, too. If someone who is such a phenomenal wonder, you just kind of want to step in the ring and just kind of experience that. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it, 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 you, you never really get it unless you are training. Uh, so, you know, I have met so many people, Benny Aquinas, uh, Don the Dragon Wilson, you know, I'll go to an event and I'll see these guys. It's like, man, I would love to, to get in the ring and just, you know, just trade some with these guys. I mean, those would, would be a couple of guys that, uh, that I definitely want to, you know, trade blows with just for fun. What is a question that you wish people would ask you? And then we're going to ask you that question. Oh, wow. Well, you get some, some in-depth things that really make me think. What is the secret to success in martial arts? What is the secret to success in martial arts? I think it's all about uh, personal discipline, committing yourself to learn a system uh, and learning it, uh, you know, getting your black belt in it, uh, and then 
sharing it with others. I, I like cross training. I think it's important to cross train, but I think I think you sh you should get one of them. You know, get a black belt, one of them, so that you you have that that you know that certification, that validation for that system. But also know that system in and out. You know, I don't. Uh, you know, it's one thing to say, okay, I've got my green belt in here and I'm going to move about here. And, 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 and so, and you know what, you come sure that person can, can protect himself and, and pressure test it without with different things. But I think there's a personal, there's a amount of, of personal accomplishment in, in getting that showed on and, and getting those stripes. But then uh, in addition is how do you give back? You know, uh, do you, do you, in turn, train others. And, and from, from my school, as soon as you're a brown belt, I start to enlist you and have you train because you know this just as well as any of us is you learn when you teach because, you know, now you're saying, okay, we, we're doing this move. And then you have to explain why you're doing that move and, you know, the practicality and, and the, the correct way of doing it. And you have to ask if you're doing it correctly, you know, are you doing it the way that I'm describing it? So the, the most, uh, that the most validation comes from when you teach, uh, and then after that has ran its iterations, you know, you learn so much. And I always, you know, whenever I'm training, uh, even teaching classes or teaching one of my sick fighting classes, I come back and I say, what did I learn today? But it, it, it is about, uh, about how you communicate with others and, and how you, you teach them the way of your system. Excellent, excellent. I mean, fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Of course, of course, yeah. It's such a refreshing experience to have a conversation with someone with a different background in Kempo and still be able to find common ground on the positive aspects the systems have to offer. We'd like to thank Mr. Vidal for his time and sharing his experience with us. Now, he will be back with us in the next episode discussing Filipino stick fighting and how to get the most out of your training. I would also like to extend a thank you to Sensei William Christopher Ford for providing us footage from his own channel. Sensei Ford has a wonderful series as he talks to prominent instructors of other martial arts, so be sure to visit his channel, and we've provided the link to that in the description below. Be sure to give the good old crane kick to that notification bell to get the alert when the next week's episode drops. Thanks for watching.